Thank you very much, guys. I'm uh, excited to be here. Um, I actually didn't do a ton of slides. I know that everyone kind of has their own issues individually, so I left. Uh, I just want to spend a lot of time having conversations with you guys. Um, to kick off, I'll introduce a little bit about what uh, what Votizen is for those of you that don't know. Um, pretty much the hardest thing that I've ever done. Um, so what Votizen is, it's basically a way for you to work with your friends to change the outcome of elections. It's a really, really difficult problem. Um, for anyone that's kind of looking at building a startup, um, this is sort of something where you look at it and say, okay, I wouldn't recommend anyone ever do something like this. Um, <laughs> we're looking at kind of, there's a, if you think about you, all your friends, there's a certain apathy towards politics. You guys look at it, you feel like you have no power, you have no, there's no benefit in participation, and the system is irrevocably broken. In California, you really don't have any marginal impact in the presidential race, for example. So I'm up against um, some serious inertia just in terms of you know, solving this, this problem for users. Um, when I was at Mint, it was a lot easier. We had this very clear problem we were solving. Hey, we're going to basically aggregate credit cards into a single interface. The value proposition was very clear. You sign into this thing, and at the end of it, you know, you're going to get all your transactions in one place. And the market was more mature. So you're dealing with a market where personal finance was, was pretty mature. Uh, Quicken launched in, was it the 80s or 90s? It, it's been around for a while. Basically what happened in that particular market was that things got very bloated, and then Mint came in and made it much simpler. So the task was very simple, it was discreet, um, and we had a great team and executed very well. Um, maybe with some of your startups, you're dealing with some of these unknowns. Um, so let me, uh, let me jump in here. So what I wanted to actually start with is the uh, five design decision styles. So I guess to take, take one step back, so clearly design is a process. Um, the last talk did a great job of explaining that, you know, design is product, product is design. So when Enrique asked me, hey, talk about how design fits in your culture and fits in your product, I'm like, what, what does that mean? It's like, th th this, is, this is the whole thing. Um, and let's see, this is... Oh, down. Down. Okay, got it. So this is what happens if you're not really thinking about this, right? You, Jared coined this unintended design. And, he's, and um, this is a great article that you guys should, uh, should check out. The reason this product is so frustrating is that nobody actually designed it. That often felt sentiment is not quite correct because every product has a design. It's just that the people building the product didn't pay attention to its design during the construction. So this is what happens when you uh, have engineers lead. And sometimes it's OK. Uh, maybe it's an internal Q&A system. Maybe it's something where it's not super critical and it can be onerous. I mean, it's like the type of stuff you might see is l like logging into uh, a, a Wi-Fi portal at a hotel or something like that. It is crap. It's a big mess. Um, but you know, it, it generally gets the design done or gets the job done. But certainly, no one really sat there and tried to make it really nice and really efficient and, and talk to users and things like that. So this is what we end up with. We really just don't think about the decisions we're making. I keep doing this. is Obviously, I keep thinking up is forward. Now it's down. Um, Self-design is sort of the, the next step beyond that. Um, it's another low-end decision style. Results from teams that design purely for themselves, uh, most common in one-person teams. Better odds of success in unintended design, but not by much. Um, so 37 Signals actually practices this approach. Um, they are really into, uh, we're just going to build the tools that we like. And this only works if there's a lot of people out there like you, and it's worked well for them. But they don't pretend to do some kind of user-centered methodology or talk to people or whatever. They're just kind of building the coolest tools for them that they can use internally to manage their company. So then you move forward to that, and it's on a genius design. So what this basically leverages is, for example, if you're doing shopping carts, you're doing e-commerce, or let's say you have a design firm that does nothing but uh, um, sites for colleges. You've basically done all the work, you've done all the research, um, you've done it once, you've gotten a lot of experience building these things up, you have, deep, you have deep expertise there, and you can just keep going, and you don't really have to do the same research and the same user work over and over again. You just keep cranking out. So for startup, I mean, if you, you, know, if you have deep experience in the industry, you know your segment very well, and you just you have a lot of experience in building products for the segment, then you can fall into this category. Uh, this is where it actually gets really good, and this is where kind of we uh, we typically should be in the spaces that we're in is activity focused design. So, when designing a photo sharing site, the team would research the specifics of uploading, sharing, printing, and the other direct functions supported by the design. 
So this is really digging into, you know, thinking very uh, deliberately about what activity is my product supposed to do. Thinking about all the different steps, everything that comprises it, and supporting that in a way that, that makes sense, and the UI makes sense, and supports the thing that they're trying to do. Um, one of the areas that I think Mint uh, failed badly is that we didn't, uh, <laughs> the information architecture in Mint um, was not set up in an activity-centered manner. It was sort of laid out by Aaron um, at the get-go. And um, we had these silos, right? We had this overview pane on the, on the front, and then we had a transaction tab, and then we had the trends tab. And it was very laid out in terms of, oh, you know, what information are we going to put in each place? But instead of, you know, what would have been much more, uh, a superior approach would have been to consider, okay, well, what are the goals of the user? What is this user trying to get done? And, and figure out, okay, well, what are the interfaces that we need to create to support those actual, you know, those goals, those answering of the questions? So the activity that would have been great would be, okay, well, where's my money going, and how can I figure that all out? What we ended up having was we had this trends page where we had lots of pretty pie charts and ways to do exploration. However, the whole thing broke down any time that you want to get granular. So you'd go and drill into a slice of the pie chart, and you go over the transaction page. And then you lost everything that you were looking at before, and you have to go back. And you have to go back forward, back forward, back forward. Failure. Failure in design there because it wasn't supporting the activity users want to do, made it real, real pain. And it was just so like, baked in, all of that logic and all of the development, that it was just we were unable to ever fix that. Um, it's a mistake that I'd like to see people avoid. So this is, this is the ultimate. It takes a, a level of sophistication. And you know, we're all resource scarce. So it definitely takes you know amount of uh, you know a larger team perhaps um, or just more time. Um, user focused design: the ones who conduct the most user research looking beyond just the activities. These teams look at in depth at the goals, needs, and context of the users, using that information to drive decisions into depths the teams can't reach otherwise. Um, this is where you get into field research, persona creation, and making sure the entire team understands the contextual nature of the user's experience. So what's context? Um, so here's one example that kind of contrasts just designing for the activity and designing for the, uh, for the context. Um, so people might peruse photos of people they don't know because they respect photographic skills or subject decisions. Um, so these types of insights are not going to come up when I'm just focused on the activity. Um, for a minute, the example would have been um, understanding the environment in which the users were doing the money management. So if you just talk to people and you kind of design for this, uh, you do this activity of kind of going back and forth and, and, and uh, you know, answering these questions for people, well, we had a feature, for example, that logged people out every five minutes for security. Now, what, end, what, end up, what we ended up realizing once we got past the early adopters, which were like, you know, college kids, uh, you know, managing their money from their dorm, and started getting into more mainstream adoption, started getting into moms managing the money for the household, um, moms have a lot of things going on. Their attention split. You know, maybe they're cooking, maybe they're watching their kids, they're doing, you know, while they're balancing their checkbook. And if we keep booting them out after five minutes, it just does not take into account the environment in which they're actually doing their money management. So it's a, it's a bad design decision. So following, uh, you know, Intuit practices follow me homes a lot, but understanding context, understanding the environment is actually really critical to getting that deep understanding and moving past um, and just moving past the activity into something even sub more superior that will deliver a better, better engagement, better uh, experience for your uh, users. Uh, does anyone have any questions on those? Cool. Um, so, drawing from some basically drawing from some experiences in you know people I talk to at 500 startups, um, this question kind of comes up a lot. Um, how do I, you know, I got this vision, and how do I know what to build? Um, this, this just came, Josh Elman just put this tweet out just a, a little while ago, very telling. So LinkedIn is a great example of a company that focused on growth, usage, and revenue in that order. Took years, totally worked. So in the beginning, um, they're fo obviously focused on user growth, so everything was around getting that coefficient, you know, above one. It was on the thing that was just going to activate a lot of people. Um, and then engagement sort of came later, and then the revenue came after that. But when you're sequencing these things, you're looking at your short-term roadmap. What's the thing that's going to get me to growth? Is this going to get me to growth? Is this going to get me to growth? Maybe this isn't going to get me to growth. I throw it out. I do it later. Um, 
Obviously, you have to have sort of a minimum amount of engagements that the users are actually, you know, enjoying the experience on site. But if you, you know, if you take the whole wall of ideas that you guys are likely coming up with for your products, and you take a look at that, um, viewing it from the lens of okay, what are my inner, what are my near term goals, um, and what's the metric that's going to, you know, actually make me successful as a business? Um, not all of us have raised. Um, you know, a ton of money and, and can just sort of sit and, you know, iterate forward on everything at the same time and just, you know, be interested in, you know, the, the most user, ex the best user experience possible and, and doing everything that our users are telling us. A lot of us have constraints and we need to focus on a uh, business metric. So definitely understand where you are. Do I have $100 million in the bank? No. Um, you know, <laughs> how am I going to get to where I need to go? Um, according to business metrics, is a very important lens. Um, another startup at 500 actually came up to me and they said, um, what do I focus on? Do I focus on experience or adding features? And they're basically, uh, I, I talked about sort of the importance of uh, visual versus interaction design and how, um, you know, this is where you really want to focus on interaction, this is where maybe you want to focus on visual, and they're like, okay, well, what do we do? Um, so I asked two questions. Um, one, what's the thing that's going to make you win, um, specifically? And kind of following from that, What's going to make the users win? Um, I can't actually click on this and play the video, but um, in evaluating that decision, there's a couple things that need to be considered. Are you in a new market or are you in an immature market? So um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen sort of the iPhone versus uh, Android video. It's sort of an extra normal video, and it's, it's kind of this running joke where um, one of the characters comes in and says, I want an iPhone 4. And the guys that basically the, the, the cartoon works for Best Buy and says, well, I have this other thing. I have this HTC Evo 4G Deluxe Galaxy, and it has this feature, and it has that feature, and it has that feature. And she's like, I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Um, we're basically past the point in mobile, uh, mobile phones where you know, features are the big differentiator. It's moved past that. Now it's on getting the best experience possible. When the iPhone launched, fewer features than its competitors. When the iPod launched, fewer features than its competitors. Focus on delivering a great experience on one key point, which is just listening to and enjoying music. Um, and, and for the iPhone, they didn't even launch with MMS. There's a bunch of things stripped out, but they focused on creating this delightful core experience. And that's where Apple decided to plant their flag, and that's where they decided to win. Um, it, I guess I made the point. I can always play it afterwards. Um, as a company, what is your, what is the thing that is going, again, what is the thing that's going to make you win? Is it a core technical innovation? Is there something you have? Is there page rank? Is there some amazing thing that nobody else can do? And do you have to focus on making that better and delivering that? Or is it, again, is the market sort of commodity? And you know, it's photo sharing. Everything, is the, everything basically is the same technically. Um, do you focus on then making the experience easier? And what's the core feature that's really important? And then how do you make that as awesome as possible? And then there's Dave McClure's uh, uh, famous line of, you know, does this product get me paid? Does it get me laid? Does it get me uh, made or whatever? So, um, for example, what we're doing with Votizen is about, is about um, the reward to the user, is about helping them move elections, helping them gain political power. This is a, this is a getting made product. So for you, what, which one of these are you? And how are you helping your users get there? Um, and is your roadmap and is your feature set and are all the things you're working on focused on, uh, on one of those goals? So how did we sequence things it meant? Um, we actually had a roadmap, you know, Aaron pretty much had the roadmap done when he, when he, you know, did the fundraising pitch and after that it was just execution. It's unfortunate that it sort of stopped cold um, after the acquisition it's only been like one new core thing that's been added. Um, but we launched this core value of figuring out, um, basically ag doing a transaction aggregation, and we decided that was enough to launch. Um, when I started there, it, it, there, there actually were more features. But what happened was when we came in, we decided the experience around the most important feature wasn't ideal. So we kind of spent six months um, stripping things out, making things simpler, um, streamlining all the different um, user interfaces, whether it was adding accounts, which, was, which took a lot of steps at the time, simplified that. Um, there were things like tagging and transactions and date search and transactions, things that we just ended up taking out because they just weren't, they didn't, they didn't work as well. And what we ended up launching with was something that was pretty streamlined, but provided a core value that 
um, that we could sell, and that was really attractive to people. And then over time, again, we're in this mature market. So yes, these features are good for some, but um, the rest of the market has sort of these really core important things that we're just missing. Like we didn't have investments, and we didn't have a number of other things that were, that were important to growth and that people were asking for. So um, based on marketing research, uh, we basically figured out sequencing. Um, based on direct user research, we created our product specs. And then from the product specs came uh, the design team and actually executing it. So we're focused, Photos is sort of a different case. We're focused on mission above all. Um, the long-term vision of this company is basically to create new electorates. I mean, the long-term vision is to completely disrupt the political market. How we're going to do that is by bringing electorates together um, in critical masses in, say, a congressional district or school board or state, um, basically having you guys declare what's really important to you and what do you want from your politicians and make it so you do not vote for someone who does not share your values. Um, that will fundamentally disrupt the top-down, raise a lot of money from big donors and raise a lot of money from special interest groups and then go blast, you know, robocalls, direct mail, attack ads. It's not the kind of politics that we believe in. We believe there's a much better way. We can't just build a Facebook for politics, launch it, and say, hey, here it is. Um, that <laughs> politics is a graveyard of failure because that's what companies, uh, that's what a lot of people have done over the past 10 years. Um, so we have to figure out, okay, that's the ultimate goal. It's where we want to go, but what are we going to do to get to the numbers? What are we going to do to get the growth that we need in order to support something like that? Um, and we approached it um, in a couple, we, we, we learned a lot as we went along. Um, the first thing that we created, um, actually uh, Dave, uh, my co-founder David Bennett created himself called 2Gov, which was um, the first iteration of this where we went out, we got all the, a lot of voter data, and we let people send um, sort of certified tweets to Congress, basically tell their officials um, what they were thinking on that. We got some traction there, that was pretty exciting ended up building the first version of the actual voters and product, which took that a step further and um, basically let people see their history, do a little bit more things. Ultimately, it was, about, um, it was still about lobbying and sending these certified letters in. And it got some good adoption and, and people were sharing them. But ultimately, what we, what we realized was, and as our technology evolved, um, it wasn't going to get us the kind of growth we were looking for. It wasn't differentiated enough with other sort of petition and lobbying applications out there, and there's a lot of them. And what the rest of our market was doing was this sort of race to the bottom. It's like how can the rest of the market was in this mindset of how can we make this sort of communication to government easier? Oh, if only it was easier to send a letter, if only it was easier to reach my officials. Um, kind of from a vision perspective, what we realize is that that's just not going to deliver the kind of transformative change that we want in the country. Um, and, and where we ended up going is, instead of just claiming my own record, now I can go out there and we have the technology to find all of your friends that are voters. And how can we work with, basically, me as a voter that votes a lot of the time, that's important. What's more important and what gets me taken more seriously is how many voters can I, how many votes can I control? How many voters can I persuade? And we ended up deciding that, hey, it's, uh, it's the San Francisco's mayor's race. We're getting into election season. Let's test something around elections. So we launched that experiment called the Virtual Precinct Walk, and it was very well received. And what we realized is that if the attention is around campaigns right now, if that's the climate that we're in, and public policy is kind of lost in the news cycle, and it's really just about you know Romney and Gingrich and Ron Paul, um, then we should probably do something there and we should probably capitalize that attention and use it to drive our growth. Um, so that's a decision we made. We actually, had, we actually killed our public policy tools because um, it was incompatible with some of the new infrastructure we we're bringing on. And that kind of bummed me out to have to kill um, something that I know is gonna be a core functionality. Once the candidates get into office, you need to be able to basically keep that relationship and persist it, but we just had to kill it. Resource constraints, had to make a real tough call there, but ultimately, we have to get really good at mobilizing um, large numbers of people. So that was, a, that was a decision we made and how we approached that problem. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process that we had in each company. So at Mint, there was a long-term roadmap from day one. There was very little change. Um, there was not a lot of deviation there. All there was was um, 
sort of little tweaks here and there. Like this is basically the thing we're building out. And we'd have business imperatives that would come in. We'd have uh, different partnerships and that would sort of um, have us create new things uh, in between. What we had it meant was sort of this three-headed monster where we were optimizing on everything at the same time. Um, it was a little bit chaotic. It was a little bit like, you know, warfare over resources. Um, ultimately, it, uh, it prevailed, but it was, uh, it was a mess. So we'd have uh, revenue that wanted some stuff. We had marketing that wanted some stuff. And we had, um, I'm sorry, so marketing was actually measured on just how many, how many new users were we signing up. Revenue or business development obviously measured on revenue. And we had uh, uh, product actually focused on 30-day actives, engagement, net promoter, things like that. Um, and so there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of deviation. There wasn't any pivoting. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of that. We pretty much just drove it and um, only sequencing uh, changed. Um, we did have, uh, we, we didn't actually do a lot of user feedback at Mint. Um, I, I feel like we did a couple little things. We did, uh, we did a couple of interviews. Sometimes we had mocks that we kind of put out on, on Adobe and we talked to people about them. Um, but um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't do a lot of it. What we, what we really, it was the more of the process there was just dog fooding it. We would use it, we'd use it to manage our money. Um, we would be sort of informed by the outside world, but in the large part, um, we, we didn't do too many radical changes, um, and we just, we just sort of kept going. And how the whole cycle worked, and it's actually similar to how it works today at Vodizen, is that um, we had a marketing department. They, of course, were mainly tasked with acquisition. But um, you know, a great thing that Donna did, Donna Wells, um, she's now CEO of MindFlash, um, she did a lot of the research. She did a lot of the traditional work. Um, she did surveys. She did you know, a lot of stuff on SurveyMonkey, a lot of emailing, and basically quantified that down to, OK, like what, what are the things that people really want right now? And it wasn't dictating things but it was information that we had at our disposal, and we knew that if we delivered you know, the features in the sequence that you know, customers most want, then it would help drive growth. Obviously very important. Once we get there, then the product manager would, okay, well, we're deciding we're gonna build this next. And now the, product, the PM um, went deeper into, okay, well, what does this feature actually entail? And we had actually a great source of insight there in our customer forums. Um, and uh, customer support forums. A lot of people in there, a lot of activity. So we could actually pull a ton of insight just out of there. Um, the one thing that I tell people, though, is that you don't really want to, uh, well, not really, you don't want to have your customers design the product for you. Um, one example is we had customers asking us for manual transactions over and over and over again. It was a very specific request. And then what you have to do with specific requests like that is, OK, let's take a step back. OK, why do you need this? Oh, I need this because when I take money out of the ATM machine, you know, I need to be able to track that. OK, well, what about if we let you split out the ATM transaction and sort of tell, it, tell us where that balance is going? Oh, yeah, I guess that would probably work. Now, what manual transactions would have done uh, would introduce a level of complexity where all the balances are out of date, which is what we didn't want to do. That's the way Quicken worked, where you have this sort of real actual balance and this sort of fake balance that you have to end up reconciling. And the whole value of Mint that we concentrated on was just keeping it as simple as possible. So actually building that feature would have been a bad move. It would have uh, cost us simplicity, and so we didn't do it. In all these forms, what we did was we figured out, okay, well, what's the, what's the rationale behind it? What's the why? And we focused on that, and that's how we made those decisions. And then design... Um, we took sort of the spec from the product manager, and we did, we did some concepts, uh, did some sketches, um, went to Photoshop. Sometimes when it, was e when it was like really all the way through, Aaron would come in and just torpedo the whole thing, and I have to start over. It happens. Um, what you want to get to a place with with uh, your CEO, uh, well, you guys probably a lot of you are CEOs, but um, in the whole designer-founder relationship, um, you, you want to get to a place where it's based on some kind of rationality. Um, it, if uh, if you're, you're killing stuff that your designer's making just because, hey, I don't like it, um, designer's going to lose respect for you and probably leave, uh, ultimately. Uh, you want to get to a place where you guys are having this kind of constructive dialogue. Designers usually do things for a reason. The good ones should be doing things for very specific reasons. 
ask why. Why'd you make this decision? Why'd you make that decision? Why'd you make that decision? And you know, let them let them defend themselves. And if you don't agree with it, or if you have some kind of user insights that the designers doesn't have, okay, well, you know what? I think I know this particular market. Maybe your CEO is more of a business development guy. So the business development guy is out there dealing with a lot of the customers and say, hey, I know that they really are interested in this, and they really want that. Um, obviously, the designer should be operating out of the customer feedback to begin with, but. Um, Making, making your decisions based on something rational is, uh, is definitely helpful. Um, yeah, we had this sort of waterfall heavy, um, you know, went from marketing research to like go, in, go into, uh, into uh, product land for a couple weeks, and then engineering would go build it, and then we wouldn't see it again for a couple weeks, and then it would go to QA where we're, we're basically push it live and we're like debugging it like on production. So. It it was a very uh, uh, interesting process. Uh, probably, were, probably a lot of you guys have, are, aren't doing this anymore, but, uh, but that was the process over there. And I talked about this already. So we do things a little bit differently process-wise at Vodizen. Um, I talked to you guys a little bit about how we've, uh, how we've made adjustments to the model over time. So, you know, it's, this is an interesting issue in startups, right? You could... Um, you know, a friend of mine has a company that he was building for like two years. Um, didn't launch it, you know, did a little bit of user testing, but they just kept iterating, 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 sort of, uh, you know, behind closed doors. And then they did the big bang, you know, unveiling it to the world. Uh, we never really had that approach. We've always just launched things and rolled them out and, uh, and just gotten feedback quicker and, uh, and just done things that way. And, you know, there's kind of pros and cons for both in terms of business and in terms of, uh, um, in terms of the actual product. I think it works out well for us because we learned and, uh, and we adapted to sort of the shifting political climate. We were able to get data from users quicker. We were able to just get more understanding um, by having it out there live. So um, it works for us. We do do extensive regular user testing. Our favorite uh, method is uh, Silverback. We actually do uh, coffee shop tests. We bring people in. Um, you know, we watch them use the product. Um, and, uh, and we also have a metrics framework on the back end. So the way, the way I like to approach the you know, design generally is, yes, you know, the, the, the vision and mission will drive it. Um, we'll go try something. The qualitative measure of a design is going to be the user feedback and the coffee shops and just talking to people. Um, that's your qualitative. The quantitative is going to let you kind of figure out some different stuff. Uh, what you don't want to do is have yourself, you know, A-B test your way to success in, in, in terms of a business model. But it will give you like, hey, this type of invitation or this type of flow or um, some of these things aren't working out very well. We can make decisions on, uh, in that regard. So they're basically different. Qualitative and quantitative uh, testing are, um, you want both. Above all, you do want a feedback mechanism, right? But those are both things that you, you want to try and do uh, both of those things and they have their roles. And we can, we can get into that more in Q&A if you guys have specific questions on it. So we do one week sprints and continuous integration and deployment. Um, and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty crazy. We move at a breakneck pace. Um, our stories, so we have these epics that are like kind of, uh, here are the big sort of big uh, um, features for lack of a better word that we're working on. And then those are broken into sort of the, the different agile stories that, uh, that make, up, make it up. And um, the stories are generally a user should be able to do this. Um, now, right now, our core, as I, as I was talking about, uh, we are focused on optimizing on a business metric. Um, our core value is how many voters are actually reachable through this network. And the sequencing and the stories and different things like that are generally around, OK, well, how do we make this? How do we make this grow and how do we make it larger, um, as opposed to splitting it into three different things, um, splitting it into revenue um, along with um, engagement time on site and the growth. We're just focused on this right now. Um, pretty similar. Um, we just move faster. So marketing and customer development informs the product. Product synthesizes all of that. And then we, uh, we lead engineering. So at Vozen, we have sort of a, a wall of ideas. Um, we do actually use Asana for some stuff, but um, we have sort of uh, uh, post-its and flow charts and different things all over the wall. So if someone has an idea, um, we, uh, we let them you know, just, just put it up on the wall. 
Um, we have a long-term roadmap and we have the vision, but certainly, you know, we, we, uh, we like to incorporate things in a more agile way and get things in there quicker. So we do have this sort of wall of, uh, of, uh, of different things that we could consider in order to get us to where we want to go. Um, once we, you know, we go from an idea, we basically build it into uses. Um, and a use is specifically, it's not a use case, but it's like, what is the thing that you can actually do with this? Which then informs sort of how you build out the rest of the stories. So, you know, this one is, you know, find new supporters for, for your political campaign would be an example use. Or, I want to be able to have meaningful political conversations. It's very high level. But from the have, uh, have meaningful political conversations, um, what does that mean? And then you kind of move down from that. But what are the, what are the, different, uh, what are the different means to support that activity? Um, and then we get into some of the more detailed things. If you're dealing with something like sign up, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, the way to do these types of interactions for us is actually writing these steps out. And what that ends up sort of revealing is if, uh, is if there's too many of these things and you have to figure out how to cut them out, you also have to handle exceptions. So actually writing these out and outlining them ends up uh, giving you, uh, should, should give you a simpler uh, flow and a simpler product and uh, just more successful one. And um, sometimes we also need flows uh, for the more complicated stuff. And uh, that's just an example flow chart of how it works. And the other thing we do is a lot of concepts. Um, it's kind of funny because my, uh, when I first started at Mint, my design process was very immature. Um, I would go straight to Photoshop and I would just, you know, create this really beautiful stuff and I would sit there and do drop shadows and airbrushing and all this other, and that's all this other stuff. And it took a really long time to do. And, um, and then when Justin Maxwell joined uh, Mint about a, a year and a half in, he brought with him sort of his very mature Apple process where completely detached from his designs, no ego, no emotion involved, crank out a bunch of these things, you know, see what kind of works. And um, that's certainly, uh, my process has definitely evolved over time. And that's where I am now, where um, once we get the general idea of what we want to do, once we figure out the goals, once we figure out all the stuff that you need, then we go to a bunch of different concepts. And I happen to use uh, Keynote to do my concepts and with a UI tool set. I can build things very quickly um, with this method, very quickly. I can crank out UIs uh, in an hour and just keep going with it. Um, you can create sort of the, w the same way PowerPoint works with Keynote, you can create master templates. So you can sort of build your widgets and build your sidebars and build all the different things that you're going to repeat. And then you just kind of create, um, you can create the UIs very easily. You can draw boxes and drop UI tool toolkit elements in. So it definitely helps, uh, helps with the agile, helps create concepts very quickly. And I'm just going to show some different things. This is uh, different concepts for how you can explore your, uh, your voter network. So when you connect the voters in and you, and you connect your different social networks, what we do is we tell you all the different voters you know, and we'll let you slice them and dice them however you want, and so you can figure who you want to work with to elect, uh, elect candidates around the country. And just basically, what, it's pretty interesting stuff. So once the, uh, once the concepts are all done, um, of basically the uh, you know, I talk with, uh, we have another UX designer at Votizen, uh, Mike Capone. He sort of serves as a, I call him the five tool guy. He does pretty much everything. Um, he's a classically trained artist. Um, he knows marketing. He knows, um, you know, he can draw, he can, he can illustrate, he can do pixel perfect stuff, he can code, he can write JavaScript. He actually um, wrote a tool th um, that uses the Pivotal Tracker API and builds our sprint status. He just like built that because he just, you know, um, felt like we needed it. So. Pretty amazing guy. Um, what he ends up doing is um, building clickable wireframes out of the keynote stuff. So we'll take our, you know, I'll take the concept, um, you know, talk to Mike, kind of kick things around, and we decide, okay, well, here's what we actually want to do, and then we turn it into this clickable PDF, and that is the deliverable to engineering. It's not this. Uh, there's some things that are more complicated that will need use cases and flows, and uh, again, things like sign up and and voter verification. Voter verification is incredibly complicated. That flow is unbelievable. Um, but uh, for just some UI work, um, the deliverable is a clickable wireframe, so they can just play with it. Like, how is this supposed to work? Well, click it and see. Very simple. It's not about, uh, it's not about a five-page spec. It's just, here, go use it and, and build it. And that's the final result. 
and um, that's all I got. So happy to take questions, uh, uh, go into more detail on these points, but uh, but yeah, thank you.